When I was growing up, my mom used to do something that today would probably get her just like destroyed online. She would fruit fast. She would eat just fruit and she would do it for like two, three, sometimes four days. And at that time, there wasn't really an explanation for it. She just said she liked to do it. There was no metabolic theory. There were no hormone pathways. There was no podcast explaining why it worked. She'd just say that she feels better when she did this. But the frustrating thing is that most people today are feeling the opposite of better. Like most people don't feel that good. I mean, that was 30 years ago. People were probably feeling a lot better than they are today. Like our world is different. People are dealing with a lot more stubborn belly fat and that doesn't really respond to calories for them anymore. Like they can change and nothing happens. They have energy crashes that hit. I don't remember adults when I was a kid feeling this way all the time. Like even when they're eating clean nowadays, they have these energy crashes, they have sugar cravings. And a lot of my peers now, like they have metabolisms that just don't respond the way that they used to. So when you hear something like fruit fasting, the immediate assumption is sort of like, okay, well, that's just sugar or that's some kind of fat or that's going to wreck insulin or that's a quick track to like damaging your metabolism. But what's kind of interesting and honestly kind of wild is that modern research is actually finally explaining why something like my mom's fruit fast that she used to do could actually work. And I'm not saying you have to go out and do this. Okay, as people talk about sugar fasting, but maybe fruit fasting has some merit, right? For the right person, for the right context, for a short period of time. And it's not because fruit is doing anything magic, but it's because it activates a very specific metabolic signal that most people have not heard of. That signal changes how your body handles fat, it changes how your body handles sugar, and it can also affect food cravings themselves. So here's what I wanna cover. I actually wanna reset the conversation around fruit. Not really like emotionally, but more metabolically, okay? Because I, I do think fruit has been misunderstood for quite a while. But then we're gonna talk about this weird hormone that's called FGF21 and why your body actually releases it during certain kinds of nutritional stress. It's pretty fascinating. And then after that, we'll look at what that hormone actually does, not just for like weight and fat loss, but for insulin sensitivity, for energy use, really even for food preference. And then finally, we'll bring it all back with a simple, realistic way to apply this stuff because information is fine, but you need to know how to use it. We can actually apply some of the things that we learn in this video without doing fruit fasting or without like a bunch of extremes and definitely without wrecking your metabolism or giving you insulin resistance. Because this isn't about copying what my mom did. It's about taking some of the stuff that she did and saying, wait a minute, maybe there's a reason why she felt good. And it's about understanding why it worked for her and so many of her peers, because there was a lot of people that did it. And maybe we can use that insight intelligently with more modern research now. So let's go ahead and get into the first part and start by clearing something up. Another thing that's trendy but has real science behind it is colostrum. I put a link down below for Armra Colostrum. Okay, these guys are super legit. And that link down below is for 30% off Armra Colostrum. This is one of the best possible things that I personally think that you can do for your gut. Okay, it can help support the gut mucosal layer. It can help support recovery. There's a lot of evidence behind colostrum. The problem is that people can't get their hands on good colostrum because it's usually not legal to get it from like the farmers, right? But if you do sell colostrum, you're usually having to heat it and pasteurize it, which denatures all the like bioactive components, hundreds of bioactive compounds that are in it. With Armra, they have a technology where they can cold process it so it maintains all 400 plus bioactive compounds, which makes it an extremely like living food. It's not a supplement, it's more of a food. So that link down below is for 30% off. You can go to armra.com slash delour. Use that link, it's in the top line of the description. Check these guys out, give it a read, read through some of the papers, read through some of the testimonials. It's real and it made a big difference for me. So link is below. Okay, so let's clear this up. Fruit is not just sugar. Okay, fruit contains sugar. It has sucrose, it has fructose, and we're gonna talk about that. But fruit also come packaged with things that seriously change how your body responds to that sugar. For one, we have fiber, okay, especially soluble fiber, which is slowing the glucose absorption from that fruit. It's making you more satiated and it feeds the beneficial gut bacteria. So it's having a huge impact. Then we have the polyphenols, particularly if you're fruit fasting with berries. This is reducing oxidative stress. It's improving insulin signaling. You have the micronutrients, right? You have vitamin C, you have potassium, you have magnesium. All of these play really important roles in metabolic regulation. Fruit has a super high water and electrolyte content. So you're affecting hydration and cellular energy. You're not just getting random refined sugar. 
So when someone replaces like a mixed diet with just fruit temporarily, it's not like they're just adding sugar or drinking sugar water. They're actually removing protein and fat. And that turns out to matter more than people realize in temporary settings. This brings us to the first big paradigm shift that we have to have when we look at this. The real story behind a fruit fast isn't actually the fruit. It's what the fruit fasting signals to the body. Because now that we know this, we can talk about like the hormone that's behind all of this. And it's less, again, about what the fruit is doing and what the absence of some of the other things is doing. Because this FGF21 that I mentioned earlier, it stands for Fibroblast Growth Factor 21. You can think of this as like the fasting adaptation hormone. It's best understood as like a stress adaptation hormone. Your body releases it when it senses fasting when it senses protein restriction or even nutritional imbalance. Not starvation, it's legit adaptation. There was a study in Nature Metabolism that had healthy men go on a protein-restricted diet for five weeks. What they found was really intriguing. So they found that FGF21, that hormone, rose significantly. And those increases were linked to mitochondrial adaptations in fat tissue when they reduced protein. So what that really tells us is that when protein drops and energy sources shift, your body doesn't really panic right out the gate. It actually starts to reprogram. So here's where the fruit comes back in. Okay, there was another study, and it was published as a preprint originally in BioRx4, and it found that fructose and sucrose raise FGF21 more than glucose does, especially in metabolically healthy individuals. So a fruit-based, a more sucrose, fructose, and low-protein intake diet do two things at once. It removes protein, and it introduces these special kinds of sugars that signal really strongly this FGF21. And that combination acts like sort of a metabolic stress test. It's not extreme, but it's noticeable enough to force an adaptation. So just hold on to that for a minute, because we'll kind of come back to why this matters. We have to visit like the downstream effects here. For this to all make sense because we've talked about how fgf21 gets activated but let's talk about what this fgf21 is actually doing like what it actually does for that let's look at a study that was in the international journal of obesity this looked at overweight obese non-diabetic rhesus macaque monkeys which is actually pretty close to a human model they fed them a very high fat diet and they treated them with escalating doses of FGF21 for 12 weeks. You can't really do that in humans. So what they saw here was a very important thing. They lost an average of 17.6% of their body weight. But, and this is really important, their food intake did not change. So this tells us a very important thing. This wasn't appetite suppression, this was energy handling. FGF21 changes how the fuel is used not just how much is eaten. So you have to think of it like this. Calories aren't just numbers. They're more like instructions, right? They, they tell our body how to burn. And FGF21 changes how those instructions are like perceived or interpreted. It's like you're just looking at those instructions or looking at calories through a slightly different lens. And this ties directly into insulin sensitivity as well. This actually brings us to the next piece I want to cover, which is insulin resistance and fat distribution. If we look at Nature Communications, they published a paper that explored how FGF21 affected insulin sensitivity. Again, they used mice, but in this case, they used mice that couldn't produce FGF21. And they fed them a really high fat diet those mice became radically more insulin resistant and fast. Okay, interestingly, they had less subcutaneous fat. So it's kind of wild. When FGF21 was restored, insulin sensitivity improved and subcutaneous fat mass returned. But sub-Q fat in a moderate amount is actually cardioprotective and actually healthy. Even more interesting though, is transplanting subcutaneous fat from healthy mice improved insulin sensitivity in the deficient ones. So what that tells us is this. FGF21 doesn't just reduce fat. It changes where fat goes and it changes how it behaves. Subcutaneous fat actually acts like a metabolic buffer. I mean, unless you start having too much of it. Subcutaneous fat can actually safely store energy. It's not like visceral fat. 
it produces adiponectin. It reduces inflammatory signaling when it's in a normal amount. So in essence, FGF21 helps move fat out of dangerous places and makes it metabolically quieter. And that has really massive implications for essentially stubborn belly fat, but also insulin resistance and even just like energy management and stability. So this is where it gets even more counterintuitive because FGF21 doesn't just change our metabolism, it changes what you want to eat. So if we look at cell metabolism, there was another FGF21 study that they did on food preference. They found that when researchers administered external FGF21 to both mice and monkeys, it did some weird stuff. They noticed that their preference for sweet foods and even alcohol went down. Well, if you're eating a bunch of fruit, you're eating sweet foods, but maybe you'd want to eat less, right? So mechanistically, this actually worked through a co-receptor of FGF21 that's in the brain, and it reduced dopamine signaling in a part of the brain that's associated with appetite, the nucleus accumbens. So FGF21 doesn't make food less available, it kind of makes it less rewarding. So instead of these crazy cravings all the time, the drive itself to like want to eat something gets quieter. And it might explain why some people come out of short fruit-based resets feeling a little less obsessed with sugar, not more. It didn't get them more hooked. It's very different than like standard American diet. But there's another direct metabolic effect that we want to talk about. That's energy expenditure itself, like how many calories you actually burn. And there was a study in nutritional biochemistry that fed mice different diets for 15 weeks. They gave one group a, a high sucrose diet. They found that the high sucrose group gained less weight despite similar intake because their energy expenditure increased. So FGF21 levels were highest, and that made brown fat markers like UCP, like uncoupling protein one, go up. That released stored up energy, it uncouples energy production. So instead of storing energy as ATP or fat, it releases it as heat. It's a non-shivering thermogenesis. So more calories get burned off instead of stored. Again, it's not magic and it's not a free pass, but it's a very clear signal that FGF21 is radically changing how energy is processed. So if we pause for a second and we bring it together, we realize that like fruit fasting didn't work because fruit is particularly special. It worked because protein dropped. So when my mom was fruit fasting, her FGF21 was rising, her energy handling was shifting, she was improving her insulin sensitivity, her cravings were quieted, and her metabolism sort of temporarily readapted. The frustration that people can feel when their metabolism feels broken it's really that the signal environment is wrong. That's what insulin resistance is. So when you understand the signal, you might be able to learn how you can apply this without just like pounding a bunch of Sour Patch Kids and sugar. It's about like using the occasional drops in protein, fasting, maybe some fruit fasting, to really get a benefit. And here's how we can use it intelligently. The first main takeaway, use short periods of protein lightness, not deprivation. So drop protein down to like 30, 40 grams for a day just to see. You can keep carbs where you want them or fat where you want it, quite frankly. So once or twice a week for a little while, try a low protein day and maybe make it a little higher carbohydrate and low fat if you really want to. It doesn't have to be sugar, but fruit would work well. This is going to give you an FGF21 signal without muscle loss because it's so short. If you do this earlier in the day, it seems to work best too. The timing does matter. I would also choose carbohydrates that come with some breaks, <laughs> like not just pure sugar. I would do like fruits, maybe some roots, maybe some whole food carbs. Fruit is the best, like things like apples that have some fiber, things like that, right? Slower absorption, you're gonna reduce the stress signaling. This way you're stabilizing energy and insulin response a little bit. You're not having these crazy spikes if you're metabolically dysfunctional. The third thing here is you don't wanna combine high sugar with high fat. That combination blunts adaptation. So don't do sugar and fat with your protein low. That's the, basically the standard American diet. So if you do these low protein periods, you keep carbs high to prevent muscle breakdown, but you want to keep fat lower if you really can. That way you're avoiding this metabolic gridlock and overload. You also want to protect your healthy subcutaneous fat function, which sounds so weird, but Dr. Sean O'Mara has talked about it. A little bit of sub-Q fat is actually good. Even if you're 8 9% body fat, you still have sub-Q fat that has function. Best thing you can do here is sleep, stress management, consistency, all these things matter more than the extremes. 
Okay, the healthy fat storage is gonna protect insulin sensitivity. Then lastly, you wanna watch your cravings, not just your calories on this. If sugar obsession is decreasing as you're doing this, you know the signal's improving. If it escalates, the context is wrong, and you may actually wanna back off and just do some regular fasting, or maybe just switch to like sweet potato fasting or something for a little while. None of this requires perfection. It requires really respecting the signals your body's giving you. That's one good thing that can come from this is it resets a little bit of those signals. So my mom didn't have the language for this. She just listened. She listened to how her body responded. Sometimes she would do a day, two days, three days. I don't really remember. Sometimes she would probably go longer. We have the science. Now you know how to apply it. But we're seeing people take this exact FGF21 signal, like the protein restriction, the sugar fasting, and they're taking it some interesting directions. Like we're seeing the sugar-driven stress adaptation, maybe not with the best sources of sugar, but even my good friend Mark Bell was doing sugar fasting for a while. But I think that there's more to doing like fruit fasting or just low protein fasting now and then. But I put a video with an interview that I did with Mark, but the crazy diet that he's doing, that's a little more extreme than what I'm suggesting here. Might be interesting for you to watch and hear firsthand from somebody. So that video is right here. And as always, I'll see you tomorrow.